Jersey in Delaware. Richard Blumenthal, the new senator from Connecticut, and two Tea Party favorites, Arkansas Congressman Tim Griffin and Illinois Congressman Joe Walsh. It's all ahead on Face the Nation. House side of the Capitol, Tim Griffin of Arkansas and Joe Walsh of uh, Illinois, two recently elected uh, congressmen. Both, I think it's fair to say, are favorites of the Tea Party. Uh, congressman uh, Griffin, you just heard the discussion here. Uh, you both, both of you, voted for the uh, Ryan plan, uh, which is the Republican plan now to try to bring the deficit under control. And as uh, both of you are well aware, and I think most people know, it calls for turning Medicare uh, into a private insurance uh, uh, program. Uh, is that going to happen? Well, I certainly hope that what we uh, passed in the, in the Ryan or the House budget, I hope that that uh, becomes law at some point. I'd like to just clarify a little bit uh, what, the, what the plan does with regard to Medicare is if you're 55 and over, there are no changes. If you're under 55, yes, there will be changes. But the fact is that Medicare as we know it is on a path to bankruptcy mm -hmm. in nine years. And it, we do not privatize it, and there is not a voucher system. I hear that a lot, and it's not true. Well, that's what I would, let me just ask you about that, because, you know, in our CBS poll, it says 63% of the people don't want to change uh, Medicare. I know you've been having a lot of town hall meetings out there. Yes, what have people been saying to you about this proposal? Well, what I usually do is I couple my discussion of Medicare in the House budget with a discussion of the debt problem. And once we, I run through all of the numbers with regard to the debt and the deficits that we're running on a yearly basis, that impact will have on our economy. Then folks understand that we have to do something. I would love to come on this show, look in the camera and say, you can have anything, anytime, no matter what the cost. But that would be a lie. And unfortunately, people politicians for the last 10, 20 years have been saying exactly that. All right. Well, let me uh, let me go to uh, Congressman Walter. I know you've been having town halls out there, too. The next big thing coming up here is this business about the debt ceiling. Uh, we keep hearing Republicans say that they want to attach something uh, to the legislation to uh, raise the debt ceiling, some kind of cut. You just heard uh, 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 Senator uh, Kirk say that he'd like to attach the uh, whatever the ga so-called Gang of Six comes up with, uh, just attach that to it. What do you think ought to be attached to that uh, in order to make it uh, palatable for you to vote for it, Congressman? Hi, Bob. Look, we're, uh, we're borrowing. Our federal government is borrowing $188 million every single hour of every single day. I wish that the administration, I wish that Secretary Geithner would get as excited and passionate and concerned about the debt we're placing on the backs of our kids and our grandkids as they seem to get, up, as they seem to get so wound up about this raising the debt ceiling. There is no way we should raise the debt ceiling unless this city is really serious about cutting up the credit card. Well, what do you want? Uh, what do we, you want to attach to that uh, 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 vote uh, to raise the debt ceiling? It, what would it take to get Bob, you to would, vote for it? It would have to be something that fundamentally changes the way we do business here in Washington when it comes to spending. I'm sponsoring a balanced budget amendment house that all 47 uh, Republican senators have signed on to. It's got to be something structural that says we are going to cut up this credit card and we're going to quit spending money we don't have and placing all of this debt on the backs of our kids and our grandkids. And respectfully, the president just doesn't acknowledge that problem and he continues to play politics with this and with Medicare and with entitlement reform. Well, let, let me ask you this, Congressman. I mean, what do you think would happen if, in fact, uh, Congress voted not to raise the debt ceiling? What do you think the impact would be, not just in this country, but around the world? Is that being overstated? Well, it, 
it, it is being overstated. It's being overstated. The administration's playing politics with this issue, just like they're playing politics with entitlement reform. What's going to happen? All we've got to do is look in the last 20 years. Three or four times over the course of the last 20 years, Congress has voted not to raise the debt ceiling, and it's taken a few months, and then they've come together and they've raised it. But over the course of those few months when the debt ceiling wasn't raised, Armageddon didn't hit. The government paid its bills. We've got enough government revenues to certainly pay uh, to service all of our debt. And the administration knows that. And so we've got time here to deal with this program, this problem, and the administration's got to get serious and recognize that we're not just going to give them a vote to raise the debt ceiling unless they fundamentally change the way this city works. Let me ask both of you, uh, you heard Senator Blumenthal just say that he thinks it might take uh, the Justice Department and, and, and getting a grand jury to figure out what's causing these uh, gas prices to go up. Uh, Congressman Griffin, what, what do you think about that? I, I know you'll agree that people are pretty upset about these gas prices, but how do you see bringing them down? Well, the root set, and certainly if there's something illegal going on, we need to look into that and deal with it. But I don't need a grand jury to tell you why this country has a continuing problem with energy. And that's because we've been talking about energy independence for decades. The problem is a lot of the people who talk about energy independence then pursue policies that are counter to that. We can't talk about energy independence and then say, but you can't drill here, and you can't drill there, and we shouldn't do this, you start excluding all of the different options. That's like me telling you to go fix my car, but leave your toolbox behind. I mean, it just, that's the problem. Natural gas is clean burning. We have a lot of it here in Arkansas, and we ought to be pursuing natural gas options as well. There are a lot of things that we should have been doing over the years and there are different obstacles, whether it's drilling in the, in the Gulf or whether it's drilling in, mm -hmm. in Anwar. We have a lot of reserves. All right. Let ultimately, me, we need to be energy independent. Let me, let me just interrupt quickly because we're out of time. I want, uh, uh, Congressman uh, Walsh, I want to ask you, uh, you know, your big fave of the Tea Party. How are the Republicans treating you? What kind of reception have you been getting? Do uh, you think they are, they're treating you right or what, what needs to be done here? From your point of view, you know they're, they're they're treating me and a number of my fellow freshmen like they're like they're treating the American people because we represent the American people. This thing, Bob, that we call the Tea Party movement, it's bigger than either political party. It's it's you know add up every American that's concerned, frustrated, or scared about the financial burden that we're placing on the backs of our kids and our grandkids, about the fact that we're spending more money than we take in. People who are concerned about that represent the Tea Party, and the Republican Party recognizes that, right. which is why we've played such a great influence moving this debate along. All right. I'm very sorry I have to stop you there. The clock just ran out. We'll be back with some final thoughts in this.